because uh, uh, as developers, quite quite frequently we have to uh, create a random number, and very very frequently that random number is not quite random. And uh, what Chris is going to show us. Um, can you actually guess the time on the remote server? And if you can, what, what can it do? Yeah. Okay. So, since this is a lightning talk, I don't have time for an opening joke. So, if you could all just tickle yourselves. Um, so, the situation that I'm describing here is where someone generates a random, a supposedly random token or the password, a REST API key, something like that, using a pseudo-random number generator seeded with the time or some function of the time or just the time. Um, now that might sound like a silly thing to do with our security platform, but as developers it happens all the time. Sorry. Um, because um, these things are often hidden in GUID generation functions and so on. So it's very easy to do this inadvertently, and what you end up with is a situation where you're generating credentials, and if the attacker knows the time at which the credential was generated, then they can duplicate that credential. Now, this is something that happens, you might say, regularly but not frequently in the, the consultancy arena. Um, I've seen it many times over the years, twice recently, and on both occasions I have difficulty explaining to people that this was a, a genuine problem because they had difficulty believing that it was possible to brute force to the microsecond the time that the token was generated. So what I wanted to do was put some numbers on how hard a problem that is. So this isn't a new attack, this is just a generic class of vulnerability that's often found, especially in web apps, especially in PHP. Um, but I wanted to put some numbers on it so we could say how severe is the problem. So that's the bug. We take as our example, just because we need a nice, bounded example that you guys can all try. Um, we take the unique ID function in PHP. Now, obviously with our security hats on, alarm bells are ringing if we have no guarantees, but if you take your security goggles off and you know, shake off your cynicism shoes, a developer might expect this to return a universal unique identifier, something they could use as a REST key, something they could use as a you know, session ID maybe, a unique ID. Um, now to their credit, PHP explain exactly what this does in the documentation. They say it basically returns the time in milliseconds, in microseconds. Um, again to their credit, they also say, warning, don't ever use this to generate a credential because that would be terrible. They don't say exactly why or what the consequence would be, but they do have a big warning. And uh, they also rather more bizarrely say that you cannot use unique ID to generate a unique ID. That would obviously be a crazy idea. The reason why it's not unique is because you might be running NTP on your box, which would apply a negative difference to your time, so it might return the same time twice. So they can't claim that unique ID can generate a unique ID. Anyway. Why people use this, um, I don't know. The name of the function perhaps, the same way people call RAND because they think it's random. It doesn't mean unpredictable, it just means randomly distributed. Um, who knows? If you don't believe me, go to GitHub and search for it. You'll find it everywhere. Thousands of instances of this. I've seen it on customers who are very security aware. You know, you just see it all the time. So the, the output of unique ID looks like this. It's 13 hex digits, the first eight hex digits are the Unix epoch time, which is the time since 1917 in seconds. The last five hex digits are the time in the current second in microseconds. That's the number of microseconds. Obviously, a million isn't roundable to a hex digit, so the first two hex digits of the last five hex digits can never be more than F4. You guys can work that out. But yeah, so um, there's a little pattern in the, in the text there. So the first example is our original invest, except no substitutes, just generate a token using unique ID, which people sometimes do. The next one is we make it more secure by hashing it, which of course adds no real security, but it gives the developer a feeling of security. Um, there's no extra entropy there. Oh, when we're gener generating a password, we often truncate it. Um, this is an amusing case, so we're taking the time in microseconds, and then we're using the time in microseconds you know, as our, um, so we're basically telling the time, and then the time. 
another good example is using, using entropy that the attacker already knows. So in this case, we're using the attacker's own session ID as the entropy in our token generation function, which again, that's nothing, because the attacker already knows it. And finally, this particularly lovely example, when you look at exactly what unique ID does under the covers, this is essentially taking the time, and then prepending the time, and then seeding around the number generator based on, anybody? The time. Yes, so it's all there. So let's take a moment to consider how short an interval of time a microsecond is. That seems like a moment. Um, the, thank you. Um, so here's our example application. What we're going to do is reset a password using unique ID, and we're just going to generate the password with unique ID. We're going to spit it out into a file in slash temp, so that we're touching the file system that adds a little bit of turbulence to our timing to try and make things a little bit worse. That's our reset password script. Our login script is, there's a deliberate error in this, by the way, and I'll buy a drink for anyone who can spot it, because I think it's an obscure one. Um, don't think I made that back by accident, that's a deliberate error. So all we're doing in the login script is we're taking uh, the password from the get request, we are taking the password, password from the temp file, we're comparing the two strings, and if they're equal, we're granting access. So it's kind of a toy example, but the idea is it's a lobbying tool. So how are we going to get down to the microseconds on this room box? There's plenty of network protocols we could use. NTP, you might think, would be an obvious candidate, but it turns out to be a lot better at synchronizing the time across many hosts in the network. ICMP timestamp requests are a great candidate. They return the time in milliseconds, which is a thousand times better than we need, but it's still a very useful thing. Unfortunately, it's not on every box, and you can't guarantee it's on the web app that you're attacking. SNMP, again, likewise, it's a great resource, but it's probably not available. The web app will sometimes return the amount of time we use to generate the page, which you might find useful in terms of differences, but for synchronizing the time, it's not that great. RFC 2616 is the HTTP RFC, as everybody obviously knows. Um, and it stipulates that HTTP servers must include a date header field unless there's an error. Unless the server doesn't have a clock, in which case you can't use caching. So the net result is, if you're using caching, if you're a normal web server, you're returning a date field. So, how are we going to get that date field um, down to a microsecond? So I'm assuming in this password reset scenario, which I've seen in the wild, um, you can only fire the password reset script once. So that's, that's difficult. You're going to have to find a script that has similar properties to that. In a model view controller type architecture, you try to find a different method on the same controller so that you're loading in the same web server on the same host, you're loading all the same libraries, you're even loading the same script. So you've got very similar timings, hopefully. In a straight up, um, web script uh, type model, you would want to be in the same directory because HD access files in Apache require the web server to hit the file systems that adds turbulence. So you want it to be as similar to your target script as possible. And then we're going to request that lots of times, and we're going to try and infer what the difference between our clock and its is. So the date field is in seconds, which is a million, mi a million microseconds, but there is an edge is an instant in time at which it changes from one value to another. So, ah, this is going to be hard because I've got to hold the microphone in one hand and I need two hands. Um, so if you imagine, here is the target's date header. It's a timestamp with a resolution of a second. We are going to do lots and lots of requests. So our timestamp is advancing towards it like this. At some point, the server's timestamp is going to jump by a second, by a second. And then, um, at some point, so we're going like this, and then it goes bang, 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 right? So when we are here, it will suddenly increase. At that instant in time, we are extremely close to the real difference between our two clocks in microseconds. And more than that, immediately before it jumps, it's almost exactly a million microseconds away, right? So we've got two measurements we're making. It jumps, we take that difference, that's very close to our actual difference. 
We also know, because we know how big a range we've got in our results, how far we are from completing the entire million microsecond range. So we can correct for that distance as well, just by adding it. So this is our methodology. We find a script with similar timing. We request many, many times to find the difference between our two clocks. We take the maximum of the differences, and then we apply a little adjustment for the bit that we missed, but we know how big that is. And then we brute force from zero, and we go one higher, one lower, one two higher, two lower, three higher, three lower. So we go out from the middle. That's a very unsophisticated brute force technique in these uh, situations, but it, it works. Some statistics. So this is my test case, which is trying to replicate in the same metropolitan area. Um, so if you can get into the same city as your target server or rent a server in the same city. This is um, a, a box in Leatherhead talking to a server in Tully City in Docklands, which is about 30 kilometers. So it's on the other side of a, a metropolitan area, basically. Um, it's a frequency distribution, so the number of requests that fell into a particular time bucket is the height of the line, and each of these uh, vertical lines represents a bucket width of 200 microseconds. So you can see there's actually quite a big, like a 2,000 microsecond variance. What I'm trying to say here is this is a statistical attack. We don't know how long it's going to take. We have no way of knowing, but statistically, we're going to be right a lot of the time. So here's the actual results of the brute force. This is 100 iterations, same metropolitan area. You notice the results. So the number of times we were dead on zero is the height of the zero column, which is 15 out of 100. And then if you go, each of these vertical columns is 200 microseconds wide. So you can see that the entire thing fits in a range of about 1,000 microseconds. It's really quite surprisingly small range. Um, now that's on the other side of the city, on a land, it's, you've still got quite a lot of jitter, but it's still 500 requests. It's a really quite a small, surprisingly small window. So I thought, well, how far can you take this? What about the worst possible conditions? Let's try a server literally on the other side of the world, in an EC2 data center that's very turbulent, it's a micro instance, it's on a shared architecture, so it, there's all kinds of stuff going on. We're still within a range of about 20,000 if you're feeling lucky, 30,000 gets almost all of them, 40,000 is like, you know, you're down to the drives. Almost all the time within 40,000 requests, you're going to get it to within the microsecond. Now, 40,000 requests to that server in Australia takes around about an hour. So, is it a practical proposition to pack a password with an hour's worth of web requests? Absolutely. And that's the worst possible condition for this kind of attack. So, what what does this all mean? Well, like I said, on the same LAN, you can do it in 500 requests. Now, this is assuming microsecond resolution. Quite often, it's a time in milliseconds. So, if it's on the same LAN or even in the same city, you can probably get it in one guess. If it's within a millisecond, you can use this sort of technique. Um, even on the other side, so in the same city, um, a thousand requests, about 30 seconds for a microsecond brute force. On the other side of the planet, about an hour. Um, I've got a little demo. Um, unfortunately, so if you're actually, if you're doing this, I would encourage you to give it a go. If you're doing this um, yourselves, you want to do it on a wired network. I couldn't do a live demo because this is a wireless network and there's too much going on. So on the left hand side you can see them, that's the target's timestamp, it's ticking up a million microseconds at, um, at a time. Us is our timestamp, which is advancing in much smaller increments and quite fast. Then that minus us is the difference between our two microsecond timestamps. That's ranging over a, a million, roughly. Duration is the duration of the entire HTTP setup and request in response. And we're going to start brute forcing. We're going to have got our difference to um, you know, a statistically acceptable boundary shortly. And then we're going to start brute forcing. Honestly, sometime soon. So this is in the same city. This is like live speed. I haven't speeded this up or anything. So there we go. Now we're trying our passwords. And there we go. So we were 200 microseconds out in that case. But that's how long the thing takes from beginning to end to get the credentials that the application is 
So there we go. Um, I have the opportunity for some uh, final questions. Um, if anybody would like to ask questions. Questions, guys? <laughs> And I find it very useful because I am working on something similar. So, yeah. And what I would say is, what will be your suggestion for the developer having that is working with an application like this? Let's say public forum. Many of us may say that is using a similar technique to generate a unique ID. So, MD5 of of a time of local time plus some C. What would be your suggestion to quickly remediate or at least mitigate this issue? Um, use secure randomness to generate the token. Um, I, I wouldn't advise that you try to fudge by putting in something the attacker wouldn't know or something like that. I would always advise use the, the best cryptographic source of randomness you can, and then that's fixing it. Because anything else is probably just going to be introducing other factors that may or may not be secure. It's better to fix the problem than, you know, sort of dance around it. Hopefully this can give you some ammunition to say we should fix it. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Uh, in the brute force, how many requests did you take to, to get the exact um, it's, it's roughly two times, so it's two times the amount that we got out, so in that case it was about 400 requests. It's, because it was nearly 200. So was there, for example, the log of, of that three trials or four? Yeah, Abs absolutely, yeah. So um, what, we, what I found is that um, we very often get pushed back from the point of view of, but there's a password lock out. You can quite often in a web application find another way of authenticating the usernames and passwords, especially in these days of mobile applications which use REST APIs um, or um, you know generate a token for you know some other mechanism, you will often find another interface that allows you to submit the username and password and you know which may or may not be secure. You're absolutely right though. Um, if you're if it's microsecond time and there is a user lockout and it's say you know fewer than ten, mm. then you'd have to use twenty users. Mm to break in rather than just breaking into the, the user of your choice. Mm. So you'd only be able to break into one in every however many. Mm. You know. um, and also if it's shared infrastructure, the attacker's quite likely to be able to get quite close. So if it's a cloud provider, there's nothing stopping them from renting. Yeah, I think also for, for this case, I mean, when you generate such password, it's mainly not the user password, but it's just token, or, uh, or which maybe there is no lookout as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, API servers. Right on. Yeah, that's that's exactly the sort of thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be a password. It was in this case. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. What's your name? Thank you. Have you ever seen this in anything that's not PHP? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah. Um, it's not PHP specific, is it? So, I'm, I'm just wondering the prevalence of PHP compared to other things you chose in your example. Um, I chose PHP because it has this nice function, yeah. um, which most of our customers are very security aware and probably wouldn't use this function. Um, we've seen it a lot in programs from security aware vendors who generate GUIDs yeah. or who use um, tr sort of true cryptographic primitives to create a pseudo random number generator that winds up being seeded with time. Yeah, yeah. So you end up with a great pseudo random sequence, but then they're like, well, how do we, where does it start? Yeah. Well, let's just say now. And then, you know, so you might be using AES or something, or whatever, you know, or a hash. So yeah, so the answer is how many times I've seen it live. I've probably seen it. I've seen it twice in the last month and a half, and I've seen it on probably about three, four times a year, something like that, something like that. Like I say, it's regularly but not frequently. Yeah. But when you see it. You always have the same discussion, but you can't tell that, you can't do that. And I, I just want to put some numbers yeah. on it and say, no, I absolutely, it is dangerous. Please fix it. So. Okay, thanks very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it's time for our next presenter. So, um, uh, for those